Good morning and welcome back or indeed welcome for the first time to my little studio here in the rather windy Cheshire countryside this morning but there's no wind in here we are snug and warm in fact we will get toasted during the day as it gets very warm in here anyway we are back in the studio today to paint picture number five in my I Paint Your Life live series. This one is from the life of Beth and Beth sent me this very very lovely picture of her looking out to sea which I thought was rather lovely and it's going to present difficult uh, difference so get my teeth straight it's going to present present oh i can't talk this morning what is it very strange it's going to present very different challenges than uh the last picture which was uh, the lovely blue beetle that uh, i did over the last couple of days let's uh, go to the overhead i do have the chat open again as I've done on uh, the last couple of days so please feel free to type something in there and I will engage with you and we can chat that is as long of course as I notice that it's there I still am having a bit of a tech problem in the fact that <coughs> I'm trying to make this machine make a sound when somebody uh, leaves a chat so that I can look up and know that it's there because I'm focusing down on the painting all the time of course um, but I still haven't been able to do it I've tried I've, I've even had a chat session with Restream the people that uh, are actually streaming it out to you on different channels um, I did what they said and it's still not right but hey we live and we learn, don't we? Well, here's today's picture. I have drawn it out. The last thing you want to be doing is watching me draw it out. It, that's a, a very boring thing. And we already have enough dead air in these uh, rather long drawn out videos that I'm pleased to say quite a few of you have been uh, tuning in to watch and have been staying for quite a while i'm really quite surprised the way it's working i thought people would be very bored with the idea of long form video uh, of someone painting but it doesn't seem to be the case that's what i'm doing here is something that i usually do before uh, we go live uh, but this time I'm just doing it now. What I do when I'm working, I'm working on a block. There you see. This is, <coughs> let's put this one, this strip on, and then uh, I can show you. There we are. I'm working on a block. This is a block of watercolour paper. It's just a, uh, Let's just uh, turn the photo off there for a moment so you can see. This is a block of 100% cotton watercolour paper and it is what they call knot, which is cold pressed. So it's there are three textures basically in watercolour paper. There's hot pressed, which is very, 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 very smooth. <coughs> there is rough, which is rough, as you, may, as you might think, imagine. And... There is not, which is not hot pressed, not smooth, and not rough. It's somewhere in the middle. It's known as cold pressed. It's down to the manufacturing method. Um, but it gives, uh, at this size, it gives just about, <coughs> just about the right texture for working on a, a painting of this size. You do want a little bit, I find, you do want a little bit of tooth up to the paper when you're painting in watercolour. It makes it flow nicer. I 
I've tried working on a uh, hot press, smooth watercolour paper, and I do not get on with it at all. It doesn't like me, I don't like it. So we leave each other to be. What I'm doing here is I've drawn out the image already. I've measured, what I've done is I measured the block. I don't know if you can see this, but if you look at the block here, if you look at the ends of the block, when I get the block, I mark out at the edge the size of the images that I'm going to be predominantly doing on the block. And in this case, the majority of any images in this series are seven inches by five inches. So to save myself measuring it every time, I mark the ends of the block with just a pencil mark. And every time I peel a piece of paper off the block, um, I think there are a dozen sheets or something um, on each block. And every time I peel one off, I've still got the mark there for the next one. So unless I'm doing a different size, which I occasionally will do, uh, or depending on the proportions of the uh, paper, uh, of the photograph, I, I'm all there and ready to just join those dots together. And I've got my seven by five image space already there. Then I just mark it out with the with the pencil, <coughs> draw the image into it, and and then I tape with low tack, and, and it's very important that low tack masking tape. You do not want ordinary um, decorators masking tape. It's too um, it's too tacky. You don't want that. When you use that. <coughs> you'll find that not only does it um, stick too hard to the surface of the paper, which means that when you try and take it off, you run the risk of tearing the paper, but it also can leave a residue behind when you take it off. You do not want that. You specifically want low tack masking tape. Uh, and then I'll mark it out. All it means is that when I actually come to take that tape off at the end of the painting we have a lovely nice sharp line defining where the image is which just looks nicer when uh, you're presenting it to um, the customer I tend to trim it down uh, afterwards I, I take uh, a good three quarters of an inch off each part of the uh, image here and just leave about a quarter of an inch of white all the way around. That way when I sandwich it, it fits inside an A5 envelope. I think it's an A5 envelope. It's that sort of size of envelope anyway. Um, and I can post it off to you. A little bit of standardization, never did anybody any harm and it speeds the process up, which is what we're trying to do as we're doing this. We're trying to do one of these a day even though the last day, the last image that we did took two days, which is the way of the way of the world. Sometimes they'll take a bit longer. Swings and roundabouts, sometimes you'll get through them quicker. I hope, I got a feeling that this one won't be anywhere near as long as that last one. So what have we got here? Let's put the uh, image back in the corner of the screen. There we go. So you can see here, we've got, basically, I would describe that as four different layers. I don't know whether any of you uh, use Photoshop um, <coughs> or similar image editing um, software, but all the image editing software works in layers. And I look at this image which I've actually done nothing to this image. I've not touched it up in any way. Sometimes when I get the photographs, I will straighten out the perspective or level out the 
the horizon or do do all sorts of things to just to make it look right for a painting. I've done nothing to this one. I think it is what it is, and I think it's really nice. Um, but <clears throat> when I look at this, I basically am looking at three levels that we will work our way through. Level number one being the um, the background, the sky and the sea and the beach. Level number two being the foliage on the other side of the fence. Level number three being the actual fence itself. And level number four being the figure here of Beth and standing here and a little bit of ground that she's standing on. So we've got, if you can imagine those as layers that we could, if we wanted to, peel them away. So that if we got rid of layer one, two, three, we would start off with just the background there. Uh, and we could paint the background. We could then put in the, the, the foliage we can then put in the fence and then finally paint the figure. Adding a level at a time. And that is basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat, first of all, the background as if none of the foreground is actually there. To do that, we're going to have to do... <coughs> um, one or two little things just to make sure that we don't lose the foreground that we don't actually um, put a load of blue paint where we don't want it basically now you'll notice if you look at the image let me make the image bigger for you for a minute <coughs> you'll notice there that the um, the sky uh, runs softly into the sea. The sea changes colour halfway down. Then we have the sandy colour of the beach overlain with a, a blueiness where the water was when it, uh, before the tide went out, I presume, because it left the water behind. So we've got a very slight reflection of the blue of the sky in the wet sand. And that's what we're going to start with. You'll also notice that on these railings, some of the railings have been twisted when they've been made. This, uh, in the wrought iron making process, they've been twisted to give you these um, lovely spirals on them. Um, <coughs> I did toy with the idea of masking out those little spirals. And then it occurred to me that the closer I looked at them, the more I thought, actually, they're more or less the same blue as the sky in the background. So we might as well just, just leave them and deal with them uh, as we get to them. What I will do is I will mask out <coughs> the edge of the figure just so that we don't have to fiddle about uh, with the sky trying to make it flow. Uh, around the figure. Uh, okay, and so let's let's get this. Have a look at that. Uh, let's go back to uh, the overhead shot. There we go. <coughs> what I'm going to do. One thing I'm going to do first is I am just going to turn my tablet back on. There we go. What I'm going to do first is I'm just going to. Before I put any masking fluid on, I'm going to just make the edge of the of the hair and the pencil marks in the hair just a little bit bolder, so that I mean I've taken time to draw them in. Let's not lose them when we. when we put the mask in on because we can do that that can happen and it doesn't matter if these lines are a little bit bolder because 
There we go. They're just giving us an indication of where things are going to be. Yeah, I just noticed I hadn't drawn her here. That's very strange. There we go. That we don't want to lose when we take off the latex. So I'm just making them a little bit stronger, a little bit bolder there. Same goes for the line here of the <coughs> I need a polo shirt polo shirt that she's wearing, isn't it? Um there we go. Just sharpen it up so that we don't lose it. It's going to be dark anyway, so it doesn't matter if we make it a little dark. Okay, I think that's probably going to be okay. This won't matter because this is going to be dark anyway. Maybe we'll just put a little bit uh, of mask in here, so we'll just mark where that's going to, the elbow's going to go. Otherwise, <coughs> I think that's all we're going to need. So let's get the masking fluid on. Nice and easy, this one this morning, in terms of masking out. There will not be that much masking involved in, in this particular painting for change. I don't need to mask the bars um, because they're going to be dark. They're going to be darker than the background, so don't need to mask them at all. I'm just going to mask the edge of the of the figure where the sky comes to it. I, you see, I might, in certain circumstances, I'm toying with the idea in my head now, actually, but I might, in certain circumstances, um, mask the whole of the, the torso and the head where um, where it's going to where the sky is going to be that way I can just paint because this is a very um, even summer sky and if I was to do that I can just go straight across with the brush and put the sky in in one flow it would however mean a bit more masking so I'm not quite sure whether I should do that or not let's, let's just uh, let's just see we'll have to let that dry now, now anyway Maybe I think I need to go closer to the edge there of the hair line. I don't want to lose that. Yeah, I think that should be all right. <coughs> Just to make life easier when we come to do the the um, shorts that she's got on here because you can see here she has as all young ladies seem to do nowadays she has her mobile phone there peeping out of her back pocket my oh god my dad would have told me off for that when I was a kid yeah, never keep anything important 
in your back pocket he used to say never keep your wallet in your back pocket that's what my dad taught me because it's the easiest place for someone to take it away from you it's funny isn't it you don't hear the the word pickpocket in the same way that you did when I was a child I'm sure pickpockets are still out there, still out there working. But when I was a kid, it, it was, uh, you've always seen people talking about pickpockets and everything. Watch out for pickpockets. And, uh, there were just one or two bits, actually, up the top on the picture. I'm doing it again. I'm moving the mouse thinking you can see it and you can't. I'll point here. There are just one or two bits here at the top on these, uh, the way the, the bars keep going above this line. And along the edge of that line, the rusty edge of that line, that is a different colour and is lighter than the rest of it. So and what I'm going to do before I go any do anything is I'm going to put a layer of, just a line of masking tape down there and on some of the top bars just so that I can preserve them because they are they are rusty in colour rather than rather than um, the sort of blue reflections that you get in the twists so let's just come down here and put along the top edge of this rather wonky piece of metal across the top here a line of masking tape that when we remove it will allow us to just give a highlight there and paint in a sort of rusty line in there. As always, I must stress to any of you who are about to embark on the wonderful world of watercolour painting to get yourself one of these things. It's, a, it's called a mapping pen. They are very, very cheap. But when it comes to using masking fluid the last thing you want to do is dip your brushes your lovely brushes into masking fluid it kills them dead you get masking fluid in your brushes and you will never get it out and um, it ruins brushes but this allows you to put on your masking fluid however you want you want one of these there you are that's what it looks like it's a mapping pen it's what cartographers used to use, I don't know whether they still do, to um, draw the very thin lines on maps at whatever width that they wanted to be. This is how you draw your roads and that sort of thing. Um, so you want one of them, and to do the bigger stuff, you want one of these. It's called a colour shaper. You can buy them at any art shop, and it's just got a rubber end here <clears throat> and for putting larger areas of masking tape mas not masking tape of masking fluid on these are absolutely brilliant so get yourself one of them one of these and you will never wreck your brushes and you will be able to put lovely thin lines of masking on where you need it or big areas big layers of masking in, uh, in other areas so it's a little tip for you there there we go the masking tends to make <clears throat> it takes a little time it's a little bit fiddly and then you have to wait for it to dry but 
you will find I think that it's um, in the long run it saves you time and it makes your life easier I'm just looking now in case there's any other places that would benefit from a touch of masking maybe it went a little bit not in the first stage but when we come to put the, the fence in and the background in and so there are places like here where there's rust I'm going to mask out where the rust is and it will give us the opportunity to just plop, plop that rusty bit in after we've just put the uh, the dark of the fence in I'm also going to just do one or two bits of the twist here against where we'll be doing the foliage so we don't lose it basically We'll, need, we'll have to neaten it up when we come to do to to do it. But in the meantime, it will just for the sake of a, a minute or so, as work with the mapping pen. We can save ourselves some time when we come to uh, do it. I'm not going to worry about it as much. On these, I don't think. I well, don't know. Maybe. Let's just maybe protect this bit as well. There we go. That way, when I'm painting in the foliage, I won't have to fiddle about around that. If I get paint on it, it won't matter same down here these will just be little highlights that we will have to neaten up when we take the masking off but in the long run it will save us a lot of time and a lot of effort it's a lot easier this way than trying to individually protect each little thing as you go painting around it and, and uh, then work it all in place. Masking fluid is wonderful stuff. I might as well do this while the, the top bit is drying. It dries fairly quick, especially in here. It's really, it's really warm in here, this weather. Do apologise again to any of you who can uh, hear that hum that we get in the background. Uh, there is a fluorescent tube above my head and it hums. And at the moment I can't do anything about it, so we'll just have to put up with it. So let's uh, put the masking away and put the sky in. Oh no, before I do that, before I do that, this will help as well. I'll get the masking pen, uh, the mapping pen set to a very, very fine line and just have a look here this is the surf line this is where the waves are on the edge where the sea meets the shore and this is white 
and there's going to be it's just a foam so it's by popping that light in there when we've finished it we all we're going to do is rub that off and we will have the uh, the surf line It save us a little bit of time as well that way we don't have to fiddle about and uh, paint around it all the time If we look at the sky there, it is a lovely English, I presume it's English, I think it's English, summer sky. And it, it does what the sky does when you look at it in the summer. It You will find that it is bluer the higher you get. And the closer you get to the horizon, the paler it becomes. There is a, it's known as atmospheric perspective. And there is a really good reason for that happening, scientific reason for that happening. And that is that when you looking up into the, when you're looking across the, the towards the horizon, you are looking through denser air than you are looking through when you look higher up. If you were to imagine yourself standing on the earth and you've got this layer above you of the uh, atmosphere, if you look up, you are looking through the layer of atmosphere between you and outer space. If you look across, you are looking through all the air, all the atmosphere that is between you and the farthest part that you can see away. And so you're actually looking through, I could draw it actually, you are looking through geometrically more air as you look in front of you than when you look up. And that air has the property of making things go paler. It's called atmospheric perspective. Um, painters discovered it centuries ago and it is a way to being aware of it and maybe exaggerating it slightly is a way of allowing um, sorry it's a way of creating uh, a distance in your in your paintings so let's I'll call it a day with the masking for the moment and just get the brush and put the lid on the masking always remember to put the lid on the masking the masking dries out in the air. If you keep the lid on the bottle, it will last you a very long time. Um, that particular bottle of masking is, I think, about two years old, actually. And it's still as good as the day that I got it. So, you know, keep the lid on it. It will last you a long time. Eventually, the more it goes down, in the pot so that you've got a thicker layer of air in it the more if you, the longer you leave it the more chance it's got that you will come back and find that it's set solid or it's gone so thick that it's unusable but it's cheap you mustn't worry about this it costs pennies really um you use fractions of a penny's worth on each painting so you don't worry about that but um this is this particular type is is the is the masking fluid that I tend to favour. They do a blue one as well, which um, can be handy if you want to be able to see where it is on the on the paper, but you have to be very quick with the blue one because you don't want to leave it on for too long. Otherwise, when you take it off, it does leave a blueness to where you've taken it off. Uh, but this doesn't. This is made by Frisk. 
Winsor & Newton make it, Rowney make it, other companies make it, but um, it's cheap and cheerful and in the in the pot that I think is the right size. Um, you can buy much bigger pots of masking fluid, but I have never had a big pot of masking fluid that I have been, ever been able to use all the masking fluid in because by the time you get part way down the bottle, you are uh, running, um, it's becoming more and more unusable. So anyway, that's the masking fluid. But hey, what I was saying, always remember, when you're not using it, get, put the lid back on it and put it somewhere safe. What you don't want is to knock it over. Uh, and I speak from experience because I have done that. I have knocked it over and it went all over the painting uh, that I'd been painting. And there was so much of it that it basically destroyed the painting. I had to start again. So we're going to start with the sky. I have cleaned the palette that we are going to use today, taking all yesterday's paint off it. This is not going to be a dirty palette painting, as some of them are. This is going to be, <coughs> this wants to be nice and fresh. We're starting off with that sky in the background and we want a nice, fresh, clean colour. Now I want to point out something to you again that I did point out in uh, the last painting as well. What I am seeing in front of me is not necessarily what you are seeing in front of you when it comes to the, the what I'm painting and when it comes to the image up there. This is one of the drawbacks, and there are some, there are not many, but this is one of the drawbacks of the technology that we're using. At every stage along the line, this photograph has been digitised. It's not the old fashioned sort of photograph where you, you know, you take a rail of film and you send it off to uh, Max Spielman's or Boots or whatever and they develop it and give it you back and all that sort of thing. This is all depending on different, form, different forms of digital equipment all the way along the line. This is probably being taken with a mobile phone. And every mobile phone has a different sensor and different type of sensor and will pick up the image differently and will so strange noise then I wonder what it was. And and, and every mobile phone will give you a different slightly different coloration and everything. So the image that you get initially is what that mobile phone has seen on its sensor. The image that you see on the mobile phone is what you see is, is dependent on the screen of that mobile phone. When you download that image onto your computer, what you see is dependent on the screen of your computer. What you do then is you put it in an email or a messenger message or whatever, and you send it to me. And I open it up on my phone and I see a totally different colour possibly than you're seeing. Just slightly, but it's there. I open it up on my computer and whether I open it, this image up on my uh, Windows PC, which is what I'm working on at the moment, or if I open it up on my Mac, which is in my other studio, then the the image will, coloration will be different. I have another monitor just up on the uh, wall up here. If I move this image over onto that monitor over there, it will change color. I'm actually working not off this image that you can see on the screen here. I'm actually working off a tablet, which is in front of me here, which is giving me a slightly different coloration and a different image again from what is on the screen here. What is on my screen will be different from what is on your screen. 
in whatever device you are using, whether you're using a computer, whether you're using a laptop, whether you're using a Mac, a PC, whether you're using looking at it on your phone or your tablet, it's going to be slightly different all the way along. So all I am able to do is to look at what I see in front of me and interpret that with paint. What you see here will vary according to who you are, where you are, what equipment you're using. I can only guarantee you one thing, and I, can, I will guarantee this, because it is, it's always, always the case. What, what you see on your screen, whatever you're looking on, and whatever uh, form, whether it's on the, in this video that we're looking at at the moment, or whether it's uh, in a still image that I post or whatever, The original painting will always be more subtle than what you see on the screen. There will always be more nuance to the original painting. The original painting is always and will always be better than the reproduction that you see on your screen. That's the case. So if you decide that you want, if you send me your uh, photographs which I hope you do uh, so that I can keep doing this project if you decide that you want to buy the painting which I ho also hope you do because uh, myself and my family do enjoy eating um, I can guarantee you that when you open the envelope when it arrives and you open it up and you open up the painting it will always surprise you that it is better in the flesh than any of the images that you've seen of it beforehand. So that's the way of the world. No matter how good a photograph you take of a painting, it's never as good as the real thing. You lose something. And we see an awful lot of images all the time, don't we? Now then, let's get a what size brush are we going to use to do this, guys? I think we'll use this one. We're going to use the, this is a three quarter inch flat wash brush. And we're going to use that to put in the sky. The sky has some puffy clouds, soft puffy clouds at the top there, which we will just take out with a piece of kitchen roll. Summer skies in watercolour are difficult. You wouldn't think so because you think there's hardly anything to paint. But that flatness, that sky colour is really difficult to emulate. I'm going to test my wash on a different on a piece of scrap watercolour paper and I think that is probably going to be the right sort of colour. I'll do. What we want to do is we want to get this on fairly quickly because we want to work it wet in wet. So I'm going to go, I'm working on a board here, you can't tell because of the, the way the camera uh, works, but I'm working on a, a, a board that is, uh, it's got a box underneath it at the top here, so it's probably about three to four inches high at the back of the board sloping down to the table at the front, which gives me a slope to work on. And the reason I want a slope to work on is because working in watercolour, I want the colour to run downwards. I don't want it to puddle and pool on the paper. I want it to run downwards. So let's just get 
straight away this is why I put in the um, the masking fluid because it means that I can get this on quickly I want to get it on very quickly because I don't want any sharp lines to form in the in the sky I don't want to have to mess with it and try to remove the sharp lines we're just there uh, we're going to come down here to the horizon and to, towards the horizon it's going to be lighter we're going to take out at the top here using a piece of kitchen roll the puffy sort of clouds that we get at the top and I'll be quick here don't want that uh, line to form it is very very warm in this room so the oh I'm getting lines I knew uh, this is the danger so let's get some more water on it and let's do what we don't want to do is end up with water on it and getting What, the, what you sort of call cauliflower look looks on it so let's just do this right I have most of the time been able to succeed in doing this and getting it getting it soft we want it to come down lighter as we get to the bottom this is the danger of working in a very hot room I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to fiddle with it anymore. I'm going to let it dry and see what happens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of Taylor Cyanine Blue to, to the blue that I've got, which makes it... Um, darker and I'm going to use that to put in the C keeping an awareness of the one the fact that I want to keep that line on the horizon soft I'm not, uh, to be honest, I'm not over worried if it just seem a little bit, but uneven. We'll just have to see what happens because actually the effect of, that side's all right. Oh, we're getting a line. The effect of the bars intersecting it is going to make a difference let's put another we're going to add a little puffy cloud area here to try and get rid of what's happening there and it will look all right 
once we get the um once we get the balls over the top of it you ain't gonna see it that that sky could have been better but let's not worry about it for the moment well we've got the problem to come in here you see that as i worked on that this area here is drying as fast as as fast as i can put it on i want to lighten it up and make it go slightly greener and grayer as it gets towards the beach so again it doesn't matter with the the sea if we get horizontal lines going across it too much because you know the sea has waves and things on it and horizontal lines going across so let's not worry about it too much let's not be too picky what I'm trying to do here is to work with uh, work with this in a really difficult situation it is much too oh dear 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 let's go down it's much too warm in this room for getting this in you know if it wasn't for the fact that I'm trying to do it in front of the camera I would have been tempted to take it outside and do it outside but let's not worry let's not worry we can put more um, see into there when it's done and thankfully we have got the um, metal work coming down which will save us a little bit stop fiddling with it bird stop fiddling that's instead using a very pale wash of yellow ochre and burnt umber with a touch of Touch of burnt sienna in there to put down the sand on this beach. And but you will not notice that as I put it down, I am putting it down very quick. But I am going to take it off as I go, and that way it will lighten up, and it will also not. That's it. That's all. That's fine. That's fine. Now we've got the the sea there. We can lay that in again. It's still not. Uh, it's still not um, dry enough. I shouldn't have done that really. Don't worry too much about here because if you remember we put a little bit of um, masking fluid along there where the wave line is. going to let that I'm going to let that dry more before I 
I do anything else up there, I'm going to let that dry. Same goes for the sand here. I am not going to try and put that blueiness over the top of it until we have a. Um, so it's dry. What I can do in the meantime is to start working on uh, on the foliage and I am going to I think as I look at it I'm going to add A little bit of masking here and there just to save one or two highlights in the in the background here so that we don't lose them and save some leaf shapes and things here. I'll have to see how that sky goes. At the moment, I am not happy with the way that it's gone. Um, this is one of the things with painting live in a studio with the cameras on. And coping with the heat in, a, in the tiny, tiny space that I work in. And the speed that that heat makes the, the paper dry. One thing I have done in the past with these um, sort of summer skies to try and get that flatness of the summer sky and I'm very tempted to do it now is I have done what you would call an opaque sky. Literally, I am don't, I, instead of painting in transparent watercolour, I work with gouache and I put in, and I paint in the sky. The only trouble is that <coughs> Painting over light gouache is really difficult with the hard colours, the dark colours. So that would make the um, make the bars more difficult. Let's leave it for a moment. See what it looks like when it's dry. See how, how, how I can rescue it as it dries. You see, if this was, um, if this was not a live experience, as it is, I would be very tempted just to scrap that and start again, to be perfectly honest. Um, you wouldn't know. It will be edited out. But it is live. It is live and we have to go with that. We go with the flow. We make mistakes. Make mistake, mistakes happen. Even when you've been doing it as long as I've been doing it, mistakes happen. And one of the things that we... Um, we have to sort of judge ourselves on really is how well we can rectify our mistakes. 
question is, can I rectify these mistakes enough so that they disappear? We will see. I spent the first 10 years of my working life working in the theatre and for the lot of... Uh, for quite a lot of that time, I was uh, in stage management. And the stage managers are basically in charge of making sure that the show runs smoothly. And part of that responsibility is knowing that when things go wrong, which at some point they always will, that's life, is knowing that when things go wrong, you are going to be able to very quickly and without the audience noticing too much you're very quickly going to be able to put it right and help the actors out of any kind of difficult situation that they might be in because they're the ones that the the uh, audience are looking at they're the ones that are are feeling absolutely exposed as everything goes wrong around them. And over the years, things went wrong, things did go wrong, and you had to deal with it. I remember doing a pantomime at the Torch Theatre in Milford Haven. Um, it was, what was it called? It was called O Merlin, it was called. It was sort of King Arthur y, sort of. It was a, it was a Christmas show for kids, based on the legends of King Arthur. And. Uh, We made a giant and oh, this giant was basically two huge boots that were on wheels that we pushed onto the onto the stage and we had attached to these huge boots were two tubes of cloth and those tubes of cloth formed the um, were pulled up by ropes up into the uh, into the what's known as the fly tower above the area above the stage and and they when you looked at the stage that that's what you saw you saw the, the giant's legs basically and because they were attached to ropes at certain point at a certain point we could jiggle the ropes and make the giant dance um the giant also had a hand and <clears throat> at one point the actor on stage would pull out his sword and this giant's hand would sweep across the stage from side to side chasing him and it, this hand was six foot high uh, and <clears throat> he would have a sword fight with it now this always worked. This worked perfectly every night. 
The Voice of the Giant was done live by an actor up in the lighting box at the back of the, the uh, auditorium watching the action on the stage and saying his lines as the voice of the giant and uh, up, every night it went great it went every, it went great until one night when as the giant was dancing the rope that was holding up one of his legs gave way and his leg fell to the floor which would have been bad enough for the actor improvising doing the voice of the the giant up in the box to improvise his way out of if it hadn't been for the fact that very quickly afterwards during the uh, the sword fight the hand fell off and landed on the floor this is leaving the actor that's having a sword fight with it totally bamboozled by what to do and the actor up in the lighting box doing the voice of the giant is having to struggle to say things like oh you've chopped my arm off and all this sort of thing while having to contain the laughter that was brimming under the surface constantly as he watches this absolute farce take place in front of his eyes so uh, what we had to do then was get him out of it and so as stage management what we had to do was work out a way where we would take down the lights we had to coordinate, coordinate with the um, technicians up in the lighting box to take down the lights while we went on in black in as black as we can make it uh, to remove the the hand and remove the uh, the leg we did it we did it that, basically that's uh, you cope you stand at the stage side of the stage and you to be honest you have a laugh and you deal with the situation that's what you do you deal with the situation remember all the time that what we're doing is we're creating a painting the fact that you can see the photograph that I'm working from is one thing but the fact is that I'm working from that photograph I am not creating a photograph the photograph already exists if Beth wanted a photograph she's got one she can print that out, she can put it in a frame, she can put it on her wall. That's absolutely fine. What I'm doing is I'm creating a painting. And that is a different thing altogether. The fact that you will see paint, that you will see brush marks, and all that sort of thing is all part of the fact that it is a painting. It's not... A photograph and you've got as a as a an artist you really have to remember that because it is very easy to forget very easy indeed to forget that what you are seeing is It's a painting and you want to look at it and you want to know as you get close to it especially that you're looking at a painting you want to appreciate the painting the paint you want to appreciate the fact that it is a painting and we get caught up too quickly and too easily with 
the fact that we are continually, continually looking at reproductions. And as artists, we find ourselves in competition a lot of the time, internally. We find ourselves in competition internally with the photograph and the printed image. And it's so easy to spend all your time as you're painting trying to trying to be photographic and in the end you can lose what is a lot of the joy of what you're doing and that is the joy of the paint I, talk, I, I know I've talked about this before I know I've talked about this before but when you go to an art gallery after you've been painting in from photographs a lot of the time and paint from paint and painting and seeing photographs all the time which we see all the time we see we judge everything now uh, against the digital imagery that we that we see every day over and over again uh, and it can be a shock I personally have gone through the that that shock when you go to a gallery and you're suddenly confronted with especially if you go to a big uh, sort of national collection and you see photographs and you see paintings that you've seen in photographs all your life and you look at them and the biggest shock of all the biggest sort of oh, what's the word I'm looking for it's not just a shock but it, it really brings you to your senses the biggest sort of thing that takes you aback is you suddenly realise that you are looking at a painting and what you are seeing in front of you is paint. You know, you go to you go to a, a big gallery and you see these paintings and you look at the surface and you can see the brush strokes and you can see the lumps of paint and the oh, and it's a revelation because I I guarantee that a lot of the time you have spent been spending your time trying to get rid of the brush marks. Trying to iron away the, the that texture because You don't see it in the photographs. You don't see it in the reproductions. When you look at the reproductions of these famous paintings, this moved out by the photograph. In reality, they're not like that. They're not like that at all. And it, I, to me, it's a breath of fresh air. I come away from that gallery. I come away from that collection freed by the experience being able to sort of go back to my studio and go oh my goodness I can just paint I don't need to worry about my brush marks showing I, in fact I want my brush marks to, to show I want them to be a part of that painting part of that experience
when, I, when you look at my painting, I want you to know that you're looking at a painting. And it's a strange thing, because sometimes the more painterly I try to make a painting, the more comments I get from people saying, it's just like the photograph. Oh, it's like you're looking at a photograph. And I know everybody that's saying it, I, I, I never feel bad, I know everybody that's saying it means it as a huge compliment. But I know that in reality, it doesn't, in, doesn't look like a photograph at, uh, at all. You get close to it, it looks like a painting. You can see the brush marks, you can see the paint, you can see the marks that I've made. The fact that when you get a little bit of distance from it, or when it gets reduced in size to when it gets reduced in size to um, this your uh, phone screen or whatever the fact that it depicts the image in such a way that fools your eye into thinking that it's really photographic that's that's different that's a a particular skill that you learn I mean, back in the uh, in previous centuries, artists very um, developed a, a technique of painting that they called trompe l'oeil. Uh, I, I don't know whether I pronounce it right. I probably don't. Basically, it means trick of the eye. And the idea was that you, and you would see it in, um, and you would see it in places like stately homes and, and that sort of thing. Um, there would be like a violin on a shelf and it was done so well and so realistically that you thought there was a violin on the shelf until you got close and then you realised it's a painting. The violin isn't really there. Nowadays we can do that. <laughs> we can do that with technology so easily because all we have to do is to use a photograph. Then it would look like a violin sitting on a wall even more than... Um, than a painting would. But the, the skill for the artist was in being able to, to trick your eye into thinking that you were looking at something that was real. They would paint a window and they would paint a landscape through that window and you would look you'd be fooled into thinking that you were looking through the window when you actually were looking at a painting. As artists, we are all so our own sort of little David Blaine's, our own magicians, our own conjurers. We are here to fool you. We are here to trick you into thinking that you are seeing something that isn't there. Gonna have to.
to, excuse me for a moment, I am going to open the door to the studio. This may mean that the sound changes for you. Uh, it may mean that you hear sounds from outside and all that sort of thing, but uh, if we don't do this, Stevie Boy here is going to suffocate. It is so goddamn hot. can hear me well enough uh, there was a period in uh, yesterday's video towards the end of the day when I had turned off the microphone while I, while I did something um, and I forgot to turn it back on which of course meant that I was talking away to uh, describe what I was doing and all that sort of thing and you heard not a word of it and luckily one of my uh, online friends followers Dheeraj in India but no less um, was uh, was kind enough to comment and say, I can't hear a word you're saying. At which point I realised what I'd done. No comments this morning. In fact, I don't think I've seen um, anybody watching this morning. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe everybody's getting a bit bored with it. I don't know whether it's going to work or not. This is one of those... Oh, it's an experiment. Let's see what happens, eh? I realise very much that you are watching paint dry. <laughs> Literally. I keep saying it. But you are. You are you are watching me. Painting in real time for a very long time. Now, that last painting that I did was four sessions. And you know, I think the longest of those sessions was three and three quarter hours. That is a long time to be working in one slot. So when it came down to it all together, it was maybe 12 hours that painting. When you added it all up and added it all together, which is, I don't expect anybody to watch for that length of time. Just pop in, pop out, see how I'm getting on. Say hello, please say hello. I, I like it when people say hello. I like it when I get the idea that I'm not sitting alone in the world doing this. I got a lovely picture. If I can actually, if I can actually put it on for you, um, the screen, I will. I got a lovely picture sent to me yesterday. I will have a go at uh, in a minute of trying to put it on the screen because I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I will warn you before uh, before we go any further that um, if 
the last time I tried to do that <coughs> I made a total hash of it and then I stopped the stream and restarted again oh yeah it went wrong I mean so maybe maybe I'll I don't know maybe when I have a break I'll have a go at doing it This isn't exactly what's there. This is my sort of well. This is like the abstracty approximation of the grass and the and the foliage and everything. What I'm trying to do is all the time is make interesting marks. You know, when you are painting, what you want to do is try to make the, the paint surface, try to make the image that the um, viewer is going to see exciting, make it interesting. And so if you make interesting marks, then you're going to make an interesting painting, basically, but uh, that's that's it. Don't worry about whether it's terrible, 100% realistic. In, uh, I did inverted comma things with my fingers there, quotation marks with my fingers, because um, You probably find that the more um, more interesting to make your, you make your marks, the more people will actually enjoy looking at your work. And you might say, "Well, it's not like that in the photograph." Well, it's not a photograph; it's a painting. I keep coming back to this. Do not yeah, put down paint in such a way that you find it interesting, you find that paint surface exciting. That's what you want. You want a little bit of excitement in your life coming out of to this and hopefully that's what we're getting here we're getting a painting that is going to in the end be an exciting image. Some of this, of course, will disappear. As the um, as we 
put the bars in and that sort of thing. And if you notice, I'm not worrying too much about not painting over the bars. The bars are going to be in in general, except where I put the masking tape. No, I keep saying masking tape, masking fluid. Except where I put the masking fluid, they, the bars are going to be darker than what's um, what's behind them. And if they're not, they will blend into what's behind them. That's what happens in real life, isn't it? Let's just for a moment. Um, touch of burnt umber, touch of paint spray, actually another touch of neutral tint, a load of water, keep it light, and let's just put in here taking great care at this point because I haven't masked out her trainers and her trainers are, are white so uh, we don't have to we don't want to have to reclaim that we could reclaim it we mustn't worry too much if we if we do we could reclaim it with the uh, pigment pen but we don't want to we want them to stay white like the white of the paper Take a little bit of care around them. I'm going to miss this brush when it dies, as, as they all do, and in in every invariably in the end they all give up the ghost. But I'm going to miss this one. This has been a particularly lovely brush to work with. It points perfectly. all the time in a way that a lot of even more much more expensive brushes that I've owned don't That's it. And it holds enough water to keep going and going and going without having to keep re-dipping. Adding to that, uh, it, it's, it flexes in such a way that it allows me to do the uh, dry brushing over the surface that I like to do and the, the sort of flicking the brush across the surface uh, it allows me to do that so easily it's, uh, it's really great and as I've said before it's cheap it is not an expensive brush I do love love things that are cheap and affordable that work well I <coughs> I play the guitar uh, and until recently I didn't have a uh, a nice guitar to work with uh, I'd got just a guitar that my wife had bought years ago to, to learn to play that she never really took to. Um, and during lockdown, I really got the urge to play the guitar again and to do some recording as well. So I 
first of all, I decided I wanted, I wanted to buy a bass. I know I've never really been a, a bass player. I've never really sort of got into playing bass that much. I have a go occasionally, but that's all. Um, so I wanted to buy a bass. I wanted, but you know, one is short. One is always short. I'm an artist. I'm not, uh, you know. Sometimes I wish I'd been able to do something else that would have given me a load of money. But hey, that's not the way my life's gone. And so I, I'd been out of touch with sort of buying musical instruments and everything for a few years. And in the meantime, the Chinese have learned to make the most amazing quality guitars really, really cheap. You know, when I was young, if you wanted a a low end, a cheap guitar to to learn on, or because you hadn't got enough much cash or whatever, if you wanted a cheap guitar. They were invariably rubbish, or pretty close to rubbish. Um, you know, my first guitar, uh, my first acoustic guitar, didn't actually cost me that much. I was a teenager. It was actually a Fender. It was a Fender acoustic. Now you didn't see Fender acoustics really hard at all in those days. Fender was associated with an electric guitar, or Telecasters and Stratocasters and all that sort of thing. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm buying this guitar and it's a, it's a Fender. Oh, I was really sort of you know, I thought I was the bee's knees, I tell you. It didn't play well at all. I'd never... I w it wasn't long before I wished I'd never bought it. Because I never really took to it. It was... It didn't strum well. It was a smallish body. And it hadn't got the power and residence of, residence, resonance of guitars that my friends had. And it was awful. Now, back to my story. I decided to take a risk. And I bought a Glary. G-L-A-R-Y Glary. Um, bass guitar. Off the internet. Direct from the, the manufacturer's website. It cost... I had it for, I think it was, I think it was Christmas I had, it, I had it for, as a present. It cost just, just over £80. And that was including shipping and a case that came with it. Uh, uh, <coughs> and other things, you know, a plectrum. Uh, but, you know... It was all in. And I thought, I hope it's going to be good. I have no idea if I'm making a big mistake or, or, or whether it's going to be all right. And I watched loads and loads of reviews on the internet of people saying, oh, well, there's this little, you know, there's this bit is wrong with it as a little bit here where the paint surface isn't as good as it could be and and I'm thinking it's less than 80 quid as bleeding guitar and you're looking and saying oh the paint surface isn't as brilliant as it could be in the past I've often bought second hand instruments because that way you get a more generally get a higher quality instrument a more expensive instrument but it's been played and it's been gigged and people invariably it's got marks on it and notches and I don't care what I care is the way it 
feels and what it sounds like. And anyway, I bought this Clary guitar and it arrived two days later and I opened it up. It was absolutely perfect. Absolutely blemish free. Perfect. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better finish. You finish and it's gorgeous. Did it play well? Plugged it in. Plays like a bass guitar. Plays great. I practiced with it. I learned to play bass on it, really. And I probably still play bass like a guitarist, but hey, I've done a lot, plenty of recording with it. And uh, I did buy a set of strings for it. The strings that came on it weren't the best, they weren't brilliant. And I decided to buy some round round strings for it and I'm so glad I did because I love them. Um, some, sorry, not round round, some flat round, stri flat round strings so that they're nice and smooth. Uh, which, when you're playing bass guitar, I think it works well. I like it. Anyway. Suffice it to say that this guitar costs not much money and I've made so many recordings on it. Basically, I've had so much joy out of it in the past few months. I've had my £80 worth ages ago. Stop fiddling around those bars going to be darker anyway. And, uh, and so when it came to my birthday in July, months later, I said, I'd like another guitar. I'd like an acoustic guitar. So I'd, I watched lots of videos on the internet, blah, 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 and all the rest of it. And I decided to buy a Harley Benton guitar. It came from a company called Thoman in Germany. It took a few days to arrive, but hey, still arrived before my birthday. And uh, oh, goodness gracious me, I've had so much fun with it. And again, it was about 80 quid you really cannot you couldn't a few years back when I was younger you could not get a playable instrument for that price the action would be like way high it's, it's, hurt your fingers to play the damn thing the the frets would have been sort of rough and cut your hand as you moved your hand down the guitar and everything but this no 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 this was absolutely fine and so I spent an awful lot of time playing and recording and it's got me through lockdown really Didn't really feel like painting much, spent an awful lot of time. Um, uh, okay, there. 
Oh, that's not too bad, actually. Sometimes it seems this seems to work best. This live painting lot seems to work best if I <laughs> if I go off on one and start talking about music or or something else uh, and just paint as I would do if you weren't even watching. It just seems to to work. We're better that way, really. My, my brain sort of goes into um, autopilot in a way, I suppose. And my hand, my eyes see my hand paints, and my brain goes into it's. I suppose it's like driving a car. I mean, once you've learned to drive. And you got used to it. You don't think about changing gear and that sort of thing anymore, do you? You just, you just do it. Good morning, Judas. <laughs> do you sing as well as play the guitar? Yes, I do indeed. Yes, I do indeed. I write songs um and i record them and in the past um i've had bands and i've been the front man in the band i've we've done covers we've, i've written songs we've done my songs and all that sort of thing so i do in fact sing as well as play the guitar in fact if you are lucky i might play you one i can actually do it off this computer would you like to hear one of my recordings? Answer yes or no. <laughs> I won't force it on you. <laughs> I actually sang a little bit yesterday, I was it, or the day before, while I was drawing. But uh, here you are. I will I'll try I'll make sure it's try to make sure it's not too loud. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, I think you should still be able to see see me. Oh, I pressed the wrong thing. Typical. Please don't make uh, this go away. Come on, let's see. Uh, uh, where's that? Where's my explorer window? There we go. Um, where did I put it? in there I actually put this on onto the computer the other day you have to be patient with me while I find it I've got to see users Lunch. hmm I'm still here. I am flicking through this computer. I know I put this on there the other day. Just uh, let's pay 
saying? Use that file. Drag that across there. Right. Don't know how, whether it's going to be too loud or what, we'll have to just go with it. Here we are. We'll have a little bit of sort of a bit country, rocky sort of thing. This is one that I did uh, a few months ago during lockdown. This has been my lockdown thing. Play with. Can hear that? It was early one Sunday morning when the world was still asleep. Put on my boots and I started walking. This small town living's not for me. Headed out down that dusty highway. Just my dreams and me Don't know where I'm headed But there's a big old world to see Cut off the buzz in the great big city With my dreams in a bag I was young and pretty Had the world at my feet Started looking for a place to stay You know they tell you that those streets are paved with gold And you're headed for a win But I can tell you that those streets are paved with dirt Like anywhere I've ever been Don't trust the bright lights Don't let them dress Trust the bright lights The flashing eyes will tell you lies Don't trust the bright lights Cause all that glitters ain't what it seems Don't trust the bright lights Don't you let them steal your dreams Bright lights Don't let them drag 
Uh, there you go. You, uh, you are the second person in the world to have heard that. That that was the first public performance of that song. You were there. Uh, no, I don't have a YouTube site for my music. Um, I, I've been toying with the idea um, for the last few months. I just haven't got around to get, doing it yet. It, does that worry when you've done it yourself, um, all on your own in a, in your uh, front room studio, which is what that is, uh, and you've played everything yourself, you've sung it, you've sung it all yourself, you've written it, and you've done all the whole, sh the whole shebang yourself, that you don't really know whether it's any good. There's always this feeling that maybe it's rubbish. Um, so. That was that was me taking the plunge, to be perfectly honest. That was me taking the plunge and uh, uh, playing it to somebody else, um, and uh, taking the risk that it might be rubbish. You never know. <laughs> but uh, oh, I'm sure you'll be kind. Thank you. I, uh, I'm not concerned about, I'm never concerned about the recording side because that's what I do. I mean, my PhD and, and everything is in music technology and I've taught sound recording at university quite a few times and, and everything. So that's, that's not the concern really. I think it's, the concern is when you're actually doing it all yourself. It's very hard to judge whether it's any good or not. You know, you, you thank you. I'm I'm glad you I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I'll probably. I have, I, I, the reason it was that I was able to play it is that I did actually get the idea um, the other day that while I have people here for another reason, um, I have to some degree a captive audience and I thought, oh, well, I might play them some of my music and let's see what they think of it. So there you are, you're the first. Oh, cool. Oh, that's nice. It's, uh, I have done all sorts of uh, things as well. I've done, um, I've done some stuff that is much more, <laughs> a little bit cheesy, I suppose, a bit more, um, oh, what's the word? A little bit more old fashioned, maybe. Um, and then some stuff that's rockier. But uh, that's the sort of music that I like. It's uh, I, I'm I'm quite keen on country country music, modern country music. You know, not the not the cheesy old stuff. But um, and uh, I've got I've got quite a few songs that are. That I've written during lockdown that are not quite ready yet. That are nearly ready. That I'm, I I must get down and and finish off. Um, that's why I haven't been painting much really during during lockdown. I got very much bitten by the music bug again and ended up doing a lot of 
writing, recording, and and rediscovering people that I haven't um, haven't thought of or listened to for years, and discovering people that I haven't I've never listened to before. I got really into Cheryl Crow, um, especially the sort of more sort of acoustic stuff that she's done uh, on the internet. Uh, tiny desk concerts and things and just her and the guitar and a lot of people um, a lot of great musicians uh, over this past 18 months have uh, well, I suppose they've been at a bit of a loose end for not being able to uh, to gig and everything, but they've done some great online stuff, which has been lovely. I'm very keen on a uh, an American country singer that I've followed for years uh, since the nineties, really. Um, Mary Chapin Carpenter and I love Mary Chapin Carpenter songs and during lockdown she started doing this thing where she like just standing in her, her kitchen or in her living room or whatever the dog in the background just putting her phone there and just performing a song and it was fantastic it was great loved it So we'll probably have, uh, we'll probably end up with Steve's radio station going on in the background. Uh, well, I paint before too long. Nice, actually, it gives me a break from talking. Might be something that I do in the in the later stages of the painting in the afternoon sessions, um, when I start to run out of things to say. Seems to run out of things to say as the day goes on. Um, So when I do create my uh, my YouTube channel for my music, I, I, you'll you'll be one of the first people that I I tell. <laughs> you can be my you can be my first fan. <laughs> It's just coming along in the background while I start to thinking about music instead of uh, instead of thinking about um, oh, so easy painting. Well, exactly. I'm not. I to be honest, I don't actually record really anybody else's music. So, so it would all, would all be mine. And it is all me. It's me playing everything. Um, the only thing I'm not really playing is the drums. I've programmed the drums. But uh, the guitars, the bass, the keyboards, that's all me. And the vocals, of course. And the backing vocals. Oh, bugger, look what I've done. Oh. 
that was my hand on the paper. I am going to have to rescue this. Excuse me while I panic. This is where I say to people, do not panic. Watercolour is far more forgiving than most people realise. Maybe when I've when I put the bar in there. You won't notice it so much and maybe just to distract if it does show I will put a bird or something there just to distract you I never fear but always watch out where you're putting your bloody hands Enjoying this being slightly looser than uh, <laughs> that, thank you. Uh, I will indeed. I'll definitely take you up on that, Judith. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel for my art. Uh, which uh, and this is actually going out live on YouTube as well as Facebook and on Twitter um, so if you want to go and have a look at that that'd be great I'm just basically Steve Bird artist on on YouTube I've got a few videos on there uh, me painting and doing things and that sort of thing it's not I've not really put enough effort into it in the past uh, but I do want to put more effort into it. The problem is that I have a I have a lot more followers. I have a lot of followers on. To be honest, I've got a lot of followers on Twitter. I've got nearly six thousand followers on Twitter, but it doesn't really bring me any much in the way of engagement. Um, but, um, and I've got a lot, I get a lot more interaction, that should be alright, on Facebook than I do on anything else. I've got quite a few hundred followers, probably about 1,500 or more followers um, between the two, between the, the, my personal page, which you're probably on at the moment. Uh, and my um, artist page but um, I, I it's much di more difficult to get the followers on YouTube you have to put in a lot of effort so I do need to concentrate on that and it would be nice to be able to get people to move from Facebook over to YouTube and subscribe on YouTube and watch me do this on YouTube and hopefully in time I can build up more interest and more of a following on YouTube because YouTube's the only way that you can actually monetize this this thing that I'm doing here I mean yes I hope to sell the paintings uh, 
but you know you need to make to exist properly doing all this sort of thing nowadays you need as they say to get multiple income sources so a YouTube channel would be nice Alina Ginger Tail. Okay, I will do that. Never heard of her. There are so many people out there on YouTube doing really great stuff. And quite clever stuff as well, you know. I, didn't, I, it, it, I mean, I was telling this, that, that we got into this because I was telling the story of me buying the, the cheap instruments and everything. And I think it wasn't until I actually did that that I started. And another thing I did during the beginning of YouTube was I concentrated quite a, a for quite a while on teaching myself to play keyboards and piano sort of thing um, better than... I've done before. I mean, I've never been very good, to be honest. I've never really put the effort in. But uh, it was that, I think, that gave me the confidence to, start, to have a go and do everything on the basis that there was only me around. Uh, you know, I like to play with other people, but that, that's not been an option for a while. Oh, Russian, okay. Ginger Tail does not sound like a very Russian name, I must say. Sounds like a cat. I will have a look at her when we t when I take a break. I'm not going to make the same mistake that I made a few minutes ago again. If you notice, I put a piece of paper under my hand so that I do not get a blob of paint on my hand and shove it into the middle of the sky like I did a few minutes ago. the top bar. <laughs> Ginger hair. I thought I, mean, I thought maybe yes. Just like the lady that I am painting here in this picture. Interesting, actually, there is a um, a connection between this painting that I'm doing now and the painting that I did, uh, the one before last, the double portrait that I did. Uh, the monochrome double portrait because this uh, lady Beth is their daughter I don't know whether they know that she's asked me to do this one um, but it's interesting actually I have painted her before uh, in the past during my first I Paint Your Life project. Uh, in one of my favourite paintings that I've actually painted as, uh, in, in, this, in this sort of context. Um, and, then, and in that one, she had her back to me as well.
wonder if I can get it on the screen. Let's have a look. Add image. see this happening I think you can just see the painting on the screen can't you <laughs> yeah I have that trouble with the with the what I'm doing in here, doing here I'm actually using two mobile two old mobile phones as the uh, cameras to do all this and I keep having to make sure that I'm charging them up because there's not enough power coming out of the computer to keep them going so every time I stop I pop them on charge uh, where's no, I, I do know that I put this, put these. Definitely put these onto. Ah, is that it? Is it in there? I think it might be in here. Uh, where am I? Um, is it this? it might be this one yeah this is it There we go, let's, ch let's just resize it, uh, transform. There we are, this is, this, is, uh, this is the other painting that I did. This is the first painting I did for James who, um, who commissioned the last uh, book one of painting, the, the double portrait that I did, uh, the one before last. And this is um, a photograph from a photograph that James took at the Black Country Museum in uh, near St Dudley. And uh, this is, they had a Peaky Blinders night because a lot of Peaky Blinders uh, was recorded at the Black Country Museum. And they had a Peaky Blinders night where everybody turned up in costume and everything and had a great, a great time. And this lady here in the foreground of this picture with her back to me is Beth that that has commissioned this picture and is the lady here with again with her back to me I have no idea I, I, I am going to become an expert at painting her back but this is one of my favorite pictures that I've done um, and so uh, let's just get rid of that leave it there so people can see and uh, if I want to show it again later on this afternoon right we're getting there we are we are getting there indeed 
Uh, this is the, one of the first ones with the uh, with the twisting in the wrought iron work. which starts round about just after her head. methods working I think it will Yes. You know, I just might play another song while I'm sitting here, just past the time while I do this fiddly bit here, and so I don't have to keep talking all the time. What have we got, Stephen? Let's find out. This is a bit bluesy. This is one of the. This is a, one of my bluesy numbers.
Nothing But Blue by myself, Steve Bird. You are listening to I Paint Your Life Radio here in sunny Cheshire. <laughs> uh, what a... Well, I'm having a bit of a fiddle time here with... Uh, with these twisty bars. But uh, I think they're going to look all right. I think I might have to put a little bit of a, a run a brush over them a little bit towards the end, just before, so that I uh, so they get a little bit more realistic. This is the first time you've ever had your own private music concert, isn't it? Ha, ha, ha. 
Oh, a Zoom, a Zoom folk group. Oh, so do you sing and play as well then? Should have asked before. Very rude of me, just... That's a really nice idea, Zoom Folk Club, I must say. You might have to send me a link to it. I haven't been to a folk club for many years. They were a big thing as I was, when I was growing up in the 70s, the folk scene and folk club scene was great. I used to go to folk clubs all the time. And usually to just sing along and listen, occasionally to play, but uh, you used to have some great times in, in the folk clubs. Yeah, thank you. I like that. goodness it's just gone quarter to one and I've been painting for uh, quite a long time I shall I think try and get these bars in and then I will take a break and um, take a break and, and uh, then come back in a couple of hours and uh, work on the figure. I think two sessions should happily see this particular painting done.
So let's zoom. Folks, what sounds interesting. It, you know, I think it's fantastic. I mean, this has been a horrible, horrible, horrible 18 months in so many ways. But the thing that has actually kept it going and kept it bright, I think, as much as anything, have been the creativity of so many people and, and working out ways to still do the things that they love to do. And so many creative people, so many actors and singers and... I basically just decided during lockdown just to keep doing what they love doing and giving it away for free. Now we've been very, yeah, it's been very honoured really with the stuff that that they've been putting on the internet and everything. You know, wonderful performances by West End singers. And and, and my favourite, as I was saying a bit early on, really, has been the, the sort of intimate at-home performances that really great singers and songwriters have, have been doing. And I remember early on in in lockdown watching Chris Martin from Coldplay just sitting at his piano in his front room playing a few songs just him and the piano it was great Well, I'm. Uh, well, I'll be doing this. I'm going to play you another song. What have we got here? Now let's chop that down. This one's a little bit laid back. This is a. Uh, Latin American, I suppose, in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit of an old fashioned way, but hey, what the heck. One more small hotel, one more night alone with you. A single rose, a moon. I 
close my eyes and I'm still there with you Those precious days will always be Just you and me so glad that you said that because that song is the one song that I uh, I've done um, that is a little bit different from the others and I, I did worry that it was a little bit cheesy but um, I like it. it means something to me that one Masking on there, it's easy to forget and end up covering it up.
shot the edge up on that one. There's my pigment pen. There we go. And I think while I finish off these last three poles, I'm going to play just one more song. Uh, this one is very different from the last one. This is probably the, the rockiest of the, uh, of the songs that I wrote during lockdown.
whatever can they want him for? Suburban nightmare. Pull down the blinds, lock it in cause, bar all the doors, keep it all out of your minds. Suburban nightmare. Keep it hidden from you. Suburban nightmare. It could be you. Suburban 